Now, how's everyone today? Okay, so today's what, the uh, 10th? 10th, 10th. Okay. So, first announcement is that we're going to have our midterm in here during lecture. Uh, so, the midterm is going to be on a Thursday, whichever Thursday is closest to the 26th. What day is it? Is that a Thursday? Yeah, because 14 days from now would be a Tuesday, and that'd be the 24th. So 16 days from now, no, yeah, 16 days from now we're going to have a midterm exam. Okay, so that'd be on the 26th. Okay, so this week you're doing quiz six. So, so that means that uh, the midterm will cover quiz... One, two, three, four, there wasn't a five. Six is this, is this week. Seven is next week. <clears throat> so if we take quiz seven next week, will there be enough time for you to, for me to get it? No, there won't be. So it'll be over quizzes one, two, three, four, and six. <clears throat> Okay, so that means that by the time of, because each one of these represents three questions, uh, that means that there's one, uh, well, five times, that's 15, 15 quiz exercises you would have, the, the, the exam is nominally covering. <coughs> so the, the midterm exam will consist of two pieces. Uh, one piece will be, I don't know, on the order of three or four, uh, three or four mandatory questions. That is to say, everyone has to do those. Man, I'm having a lot of trouble here. And then two, you can do up to five redos. So let's explain what that means. So by the time of the, of the uh, midterm, we'll have completely graded and returned quiz, quizzes one, two, three, four, and six. And that's 15 exercises. If you look in the grade book, there are grades named like uh, quiz underscore zero three underscore zero two. And what that means, what that name means, it means quiz three question two in the grade book. So it may be the case that um, you did not do so excellently on quiz three question two. And in your estimation, it would be excellent if you could uh, remedy that. Well, so, so there, you, there, will be, there will be 15 choices, okay, and you can select up to five and you can redo up, up to five. If you want to redo none, this is fine. Uh, but you can't, you can't redo more than five, and in a perfect world I would let you redo all of them, but the, f but the fact of the matter is, is that I just have a finite amount of labor that I can allot to the, to, to the grading process. And I won't figure out if you tried too many until after it's already done, right? So I, I have to spend, spend the labor to figure out what, what you did. <laughs> okay, so then you can redo zero, one, two, three, or five exercises. Okay, and then you can have the better of the two. So if you did better the first go round, okay, you can have that one. But if you do better on the midterm, you can have that one. <clears throat> Any questions about uh, that? Yes? Are the answers to the quizzes all posted? No, but they, uh, I will post them. Yes? Uh, so on our grading, I see just like letters, mm -hmm. and sometimes there's a number. <laughs> right. So, so on the quizzes, every quiz exercise is out of 10 points. 
So, so every single one of them is out of 10. Uh, if you received a B, that means that you made no response, like you've turned in a blank uh, response. Uh, if you received a number 0 through 9, then that's the value. If you received A, then that's a 10. So A is representative of 10 out of 10. The, re the reason for that, in case you're just interested, is that in, if you look at the bubbles, uh, I can't fit a 10 inside of those bubbles because there's just enough room for one character. So it's 0, 1, blah, blah, blah. A. <laughs> and then C, C means that uh, none of the quiz exercises are graded as C, just the written homework ones. The written homeworks are great, one possible grade is a C, and that means complete. So that means that I checked whether or not you turned it in, but not whether or not what you did was correct. Because there's not enough time to grade everything. So does that answer it? Yeah. Other questions? Yes? So we can do That's right. And three out of four mandatory questions. Three, three or four, yeah. I haven't decided. OK, mandatory questions that will also be uh, similar to the questions that we had on the quiz? Well, I reserve the right to make them any, anything. OK. A anything that's related to this material. Nothing, n you know, I'm not trying, I won't, I'll say it this way. I don't think you, I don't, my intention is not to surprise you on, on the three to four mandatory questions. <clears throat> so the keys to the quizzes will be posted, and the, the optimal strategy would be something like this. Have a look at the grade book. Look at your 15 grades. Decide which five or less would be in your best interest to fix. Okay? And, and it should be like, okay, uh, it, it, it may be the case that, well, I'd really like to fix that one, but I think it's unlikely that I'm going to be able to fix it, so I'm going to fix this other one. Right? You've got to think about what you can best achieve in the 75 minutes of the exam. So, so come into the exam with a short little list, not a, not a cheat sheet, but a, but a list of the questions that you want to redo because you, th it would be senseless of you to try to just memorize which ones you want to redo. I could never memorize a list like that. So bring it, have a look at the grade book, decide what, what, what is in your best interest, practice those, come in and knock it out on the midterm. <clears throat> yes? The five can either replace or take the better, the first score if it's better. The you'll, three, you'll get the better of the, t the better, yeah. The three or four mandatory, how will those be graded? In those will be just like quiz exercises. Quiz exercises. Okay. Yeah, so what it, what it will be effectively, effectively is that um, <clears throat> you, you essentially have two attempts at each of these quiz questions. Not, not exactly, right? You can, only, you can only redo up to five of them. This is 15 quiz exercises, and you get to redo up to five. So then you can imagine that you really get to redo all of them, but, you, but you're only going to turn in five. You know, so you can imagine it that way. These, these are like quiz questions where you only get one stab. So once the midterm is taken, we'll have 18 or 19. Yes. Okay. So same level as quiz. Yes. Yes, and so all of these will be worth, uh, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> will be graded out of 10. So then you would at that point have a maximum possible quiz points of 180. Yes? So for the first section, how much weight will that have on its rate? Will it be just like a, a another quiz? It'll be just like another quiz. They're all, every quiz question is reckoned out of 10. And then all that I'm doing is I'm just calculating the numerator and the denominator of your quiz grade, adding things to the numerator and adding 10 to the denominator for, for every one, and, and then making a percentage. <coughs> Other questions? OK, so good. Uh, last time we were talking about <coughs> we were talking about the mean value theorem. So let's, let's jump right back in there. So uh, here's the mean value theorem which, which you must prove, just to restate it, the, the one that you have to come into my office and prove. Uh, let, let f be a function <coughs> uh, 
f from u to the reals. And this interval is a subset of u, and u is open. And let it be the case <coughs> that f is continuous on a to b, and to let it be the case that f is differentiable on the open interval a to b. So <coughs> if these two if these two things are true, so those are the hypotheses, then there is a point C, and where is this C? In the open one. Uh, such that the derivative of F evaluated at this C is the slope of the secant line. Now, this is true, and this is a fine way to look at it. But what I want you to observe about this equation, about this equation here, is that it could be rewritten in the following way. You could say that uh, it's ju just, just as true to say that it's f prime of c multiplied by b minus a uh, equal to f of b minus f of a. It's... Uh, you kind of lose, it, when you write it this way, uh, because we always want you to look at this as the slope of a secant line, you kind of, it, it can be easy to kind of lose track of it. That's why it's usually written as a quotient. However, uh, it's nice to write it as a product because if a and b themselves are vectors, then this quotient wouldn't be defined, but this one still would be defined. D did you have a question? Oh, yeah. <coughs> Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm, yeah, I understand now. Uh, U is open in the reals. So I'm, talk, I'm talking about the mean value theorem that the, the good old one. <laughs> yeah, reals, reals to reals. Um, <clears throat> uh, so now, if, if you make, so we already proved that, and you yourself are going to prove it, so I won't bother with any proof. Uh, if, if you switch this interval from, from looking like this, A to B. <clears throat> so in, in the previous statement, it, it, lo it looks like that. Uh, and what you're, what you're able to find is you're able to find a C that's in there. Okay, if you change it from A to B and you change it instead to look like A uh, to A plus H, So that instead of, instead of having two different points, you're say, sort of saying that I have a point and a distance that I'm going to permit myself to travel from that point, a distance h. Then you can still find a c, but now the equation looks like, if you write it like this, now it looks like uh, f prime of c multiplied by something is f of a plus h minus f of a. <coughs> and what goes here? So it'll be the difference between the two points, b minus a. So what goes in this open slot? h. OK. Now, we like that. That's good, because remember, what, remember the, 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 one of the main upshots of, of this class is that we're interpreting the derivative as something that acts on an increment. Okay, you take the, you take the, the, the derivative as a linear map on increments. So multiply the derivative by an increment. So this will be important for us to look at by the end of today. Okay, so any question about mean value theorem that, that you already knew? So you already knew this statement. And here I'm just reimagining it slightly into a slightly different notation. <coughs> okay, so then the newer, a newer mean value theorem. <coughs> Allergies are just getting me. <clears throat> Is the one that we said at the end of last time, so I'll remind you of that. 
So this is, again, the mean value theorem. But now, instead of, instead of uh, with just reals, now we have uh, vector valued, uh, sorry, vector inputs. <coughs> and that is, suppose that we say let uh, u, a subset of Rn, be open. Let f from u to the reals. So understand what this means. So the difference between this theorem and the previous one is that now we have vector inputs, whereas the previous one we were talking about scalar inputs. <coughs> wow. So let, uh, let this be differentiable. on that open set U, and let it be the case that the line segment from A to B is contained in U. So now, A and B are points inside of U, and these are, these are vectors. So let me, let's be clear about what is meant by the line segment. So the line segment from A to B is the set of all T A plus one minus T B such that T is in this. <laughs> so now this, this is a subset of the reals. This is the unit, the closed unit interval. This is a subset of Rn. Okay, this is a subset of Rn. And if you, I'll try, I'll, I'll just draw something in R2. This might be the set U. That may, might be the set U. And then we could select two points inside of U, like A and B. Then what is that set right there? Mm -hmm. It's that line segment. So this right here <coughs> is that set, including the endpoints. So I don't think I need to write it because I think it's obvious. This is the closed line segment. What would the open line segment be? Yeah, it would make this one open, and then it would be like, instead of having, instead of including A and also B, uh, we would just have uh, just the red and not including the two endpoints. Okay, so then I'm talking about a set U and two points A and B, and the line segment connecting A and B is inside of U. Now, you can have an open set and two points A and B that are in the open set, but the line segment connecting them is not, in the, is not in the set. So the most obvious example would be like a horseshoe. Right, so then we've got A's in, A's in one leg of the horseshoe and B's in the other. And then do you observe that the line segment leaves the set? So I'm not, I'm not talking about this kind of set. Not, not that kind. I'm talking about the kind where the line segment is, is inside. <coughs> Okay, <clears throat> so suppose that this is the setup. What I'd like for you to observe is that just like the mean value theorem that you already know when the inputs are scalars, because f is differentiable on the whole u, and because differentiability is a stronger condition than continuity, that means that because this function is differentiable on u, it's also continuous on all of u. And because this line segment stays inside of u, that means that the function is differentiable on that line segment, okay, and also continuous on that line segment. So it is like we still have those same two hypotheses from the other mean value theorem. So what the conclusion is, is that then there exists a C vector in the open line segment.
such that <coughs> such that what? Right. So let's see if we can let's see if we can transcribe it more or less from from this one. Okay. So then we why can't we write it like that? Can't divide by vectors. Okay. So we've got to write it like this. So what it'll be? It'll be the derivative of f evaluated at this magic point c, and then multiplied by the difference. <coughs> b minus a is equal to f of b minus f of a. OK, very good. <coughs> so any question about the statement of the, of the mean value theorem? So what this is saying, what this is saying is that there's some c There's some C that's somewhere on this line segment. Could be right there. But it's not at one of the endpoints. It's somewhere in the red. It's somewhere in there such that uh, this is true. Now, could someone explain why the horseshoe can't work? Why, why we can't make the horseshoe work? Well, it would, it would be like, well, in the first place, we, we're not sure that it's differentiable and continuous on that little bit that extends outside. But even if it, even if it somehow was, uh, essentially, you know, you might accidentally select. You might accidentally select a point that's not in you. You might accidentally point at that one. Okay. So, any question about the statement of the <coughs> mean value theorem for functions that have vector uh, valued inputs? Yes? In case of a horseshoe, if we, let's say, if we choose any other curve that completely lies within the set, except for the line set, there still would be a point where the slope of the line or the derivative equals um, the difference of the function. At least in R2, there would be, there would be at least some place where the tangent line would be parallel to the line set. I'm not, I'm not sure that that's a true statement. So I think what you're saying is that what let me see if I can paraphrase what you're saying. Uh, it so this is me trying to be your voice. Uh, I see that I could draw a line from A to B, but I just have to go around that bend. Yeah. Uh, then should we be able to find, so if you, were, if you were to draw one, would there be a C that does it? And the answer is no. And because, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm going to hedge my bets and say I think almost surely not. And the reason is because, notice, notice what the derivative is multiplying. The, the, inc the increment it's being applied to is the difference between A and B. So if, if you were to, to, to carry through your suggestion and say, well, I like this path. I like that one. Uh, then you'd have, then, then I, I guess you would select like maybe that point. Maybe that point yeah. would do it. But the, the, the problem of that is that what does, what does this point up here have to do with traveling in that direction? That would be my concern. So I'd have to think about whether and how I could make a function, or and if I could make a function that would break your idea. But I think I, think I could. So the, the, the problem in the end to me seems that uh, in the end, the derivative is being multiplied by this increment, which is parallel to that, which is leaving the set whereas this one is staying. So we'll have to think about it, but I, I, I have to continue. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so uh, today, for the rest of the day, we're going to talk about pathological examples and how to avoid them in real life. So, <laughs> so uh, what, what does it mean to have a function that's differentiable, and in particular, uh, just how, how close can we come up to being differentiable but not actually be differentiable? So, uh, kind of like you can frame today's discussion like, okay, this is, this is what math majors are interested in, <laughs> uh, and these kind of functions usually do not show up much in engineering, 
and, and and also not that much in in other physical sciences. But there's a reason why they don't show up very often in physical sciences, and we're gonna we're gonna try and pull that reason out. Okay. So on the one hand, we're gonna look at some pathological cases, and on the other hand, we're gonna show how to always be sure you're not in a pathological case. And uh, we'll observe that. Oh, okay. The reason why the world always se usually seems non-pathological unless you're in a math class is because of this. Okay, so everybody okay with the game plan? Okay. <clears throat> so, for a function to be differentiable at a point, <clears throat> that means that, uh, more or less, that if you imagine being a creature walking around on the, on the graph, of whatever object it is that you're talking about, walking around on that graph. And if you're small enough in comparison to that graph, then an omnipotent or just extremely powerful creature could replace the world with a flat world, and you wouldn't be able to tell. So like right here and now, uh, suppose that we all, that every one of us lived on campus. It's not true, but suppose it's true. If, if, I, if, if I were supernatural, then I could replace campus, the whole world, with a flat thing. And you'd never know. You would never know because campus is not big enough for you to actually meaningfully detect the curvature of the Earth. Okay, that's what it means for a sphere to be differentiable. Okay. <clears throat> so, let's, uh, let's mess it up. <clears throat> so here's an example function. <clears throat> So let's consider the function f of x and y is, uh, in the, is piecewise defined as x squared y in the numerator over x squared plus y squared. So before I get any further, I'll ask this expression right here, where, <clears throat> what is its natural domain? Uh, it can be defined on the on, for example, when x is not, not, the origin, not the origin, right? Not the origin. So the pro, so the only place where this has a has a a problem that just simply can't be overcome is that is is at the origin. So this is at x y is not the origin, and then at the origin, <coughs> pardon me, at the origin we'll give it the value zero. So already you can tell okay, that, that we're, we're setting something up that's pathological because we have, a, we have a function that's defined by multiple clauses. So this kind of thing typically doesn't happen in, in physical sciences. <laughs> so let's ask. Um, let's compute. <coughs> Pardon me. Let's compute. the Jacobian of f uh, at the origin, 0, 0. So I'm specifically interested in the Jacobian at the origin. So would you please remind me, so the Jacobian is uh, in the first place a matrix. It's a matrix. And what are the columns of, of that matrix? What's the first column? The derivative with respect to the first variable, and what's the what's the second column? Derivative with respect to second variable, etc. So, what are the rows and columns of of this particular? How, how many rows and columns are there for this particular one? One row and two columns. And how do you know that? Right. The signature is that it takes vectors in R two and produces uh, vectors in R one, scalars in R one. So. It, so it should have one row and two columns. <coughs> so this should be <coughs> this should be the x partial of f evaluated at zero zero in the first column, and the y partial of f evaluated at zero zero in the second column. <coughs> now this uh, this thing is a scalar, right? So that's a scalar, and uh, that's a scalar. 
So we need to compute two, two different scalars, that first one and that one. So let's, let's compute this one. <coughs> and we'll have to use the definition. D1 of f evaluated at 0, 0. So we have to use the definition. And in particular, we can't use the nice rules like the product rule and the quotient rule and all that. Why can we not use uh, the product rule and the quotient rule and, and, and all that? <coughs> So why can we not why can we not use like the power rule and stuff? Why why can't what I'm asking is is that we're differentiating with respect to x. Why can't why can't I just do the partial derivative thing? Can you all see that or is it washed out? Uh, how do I no? Now it's too dark to see, huh? It's still okay? Okay. So why, why can't I just differentiate that? <laughs> why can't I just... Yeah, I know. I got... Okay. I'll just... All right. I'm shiny. What can I say? This, this one right here. Why can't I just differentiate that with respect to x and just call it a day? Well, I know, but y'all took 2415 or 2419, and you know that when you have expressions in multiple variables, you can differentiate them with respect to just one variable. It's not defined where you want to differentiate. Right. This, this, is not <clears throat> this is not the expression at the specific place that we're trying to differentiate. So when you have these piecewise, when you have these piecewise defined functions, and, and when specifically you're trying to <clears throat> Uh, differentiated at one of these places where it changes its mind, you, ha you, you have no choice but to appeal to the definition. Okay, so we have to use, that is to say, the limit definition. We have to use it. Okay, well, let's do it. <coughs> so this is the limit. <coughs> As h goes to zero of, well, we'll have to do f of x plus h, uh, sorry, <coughs> not x plus h, because where are we evaluating? At 0, 0. Uh, at 0 plus h, <coughs> uh, 0 minus f of 0, 0 over h. Right, because specifically we're evaluating the first partial, so we're only incrementing the first variable. And we're doing so at the origin, so we're plugging in the origin. <coughs> so let's do that. So this is the limit as h goes to 0 of, well. So what is this first one when you plug it in? Right. So may, maybe I'll. Maybe I'll do this, since y'all are hesitating a little bit. OK, what is, what is that one? Zero. Zero. <coughs> OK, <coughs> then what will this one be? Zero. It'll also be zero, right? Because we're plugging in y is zero. So this is the limit as h goes to zero of zero minus zero over h. Of course, 0 minus 0 is 0. So that whole, f that everything inside of the square brackets, everything inside of the brackets can be simplified to 0. So what's the limit? 0. <coughs> so, so the conclusion is, is that the x partial is 0. OK. So that's saying that as, as you approach the origin, and as you approach it from the first direction only, it's flat in that direction. It's flat in that direction. Uh, let's try the other one, <clears throat> another one. So D2, F evaluated at 0, 0. This will be the limit as H goes to 0. And now we have to increment the second variable. So be, this would be F of 0 and then 0 plus H 
minus f of 0, 0, and then over h. <coughs> what will this one be? 0, right? Is it, is it clear from, from having done the previous one? OK. As a result, as a result, that means that the Jacobian exists. And moreover, we know exactly what it is. What is the Jacobian? It's 0 in the, fr in the first row, first column, and 0 in the first row, second column. OK, so, so this function is, is, in this sense, kind of uninteresting. <clears throat> but this is, what this one is saying is that if you approach along the x-axis, it's flat. And this one is saying that if you approach along the y-axis, it's flat. Well, let's approach along any other direction whatsoever. Let's approach, <clears throat> uh, let's approach along, uh, say, the line y is x. <clears throat> what if we do that? <coughs> Will this do it for us? I can't remember which one which one breaks it. <coughs> okay. So what if we do this? So that is to say, what if we what if we differentiate? What if we do the directional derivative? And if we do it with direction, uh, say one one. Well, now this requires you to remember <laughs> what is the definition of, of the directional derivative. So do you remember? <laughs> ah, this is true when the function is differentiable. So if the, func if the function is differentiable, then there's a very simple formula for the directional derivative. It's the derivative multiplied by the, uh, multiplied by the direction. But that's if the function's differentiable. I'm telling you that it's not. <laughs> so that means that you only have one recourse. And that is you have to apply to the definition of, of directional derivative. So let's, let's write that down. So the directional derivative in the direction of v of f at the point a. So do you remember it, yeah. the notation? <laughs> this is the limit. And then I think the symbol we were using was t. So I'll say t is going to 0 of f of a plus tv minus f of a over t. And the thing we remarked when we defined this directional derivative the first time is that this is exactly partial derivative when the direction, when you take the direction to be each one of the basis vectors. So when, when v is e1, that's first partial. When v is e2, that's second partial. And when v is e k, that's kth partial. So let's, let's, let's just follow our nose. Let's say, OK. The partial derivative uh, in the direction 1, 1 of f evaluated at 0, 0. And let's just plug in all, plug in all the things. <coughs> OK, well, that would be the limit as t goes to 0. And then it'll, we'll have to evaluate f at the origin, so 0, 0, and then plus t multiplied by the direction, 1, 1, and then minus f evaluated at the origin, and then over t. That's just, that's just plugging in a bunch of stuff. 
<clears throat> so some things are simple, like what is f evaluated at zero, zero? That's zero. And then uh, simplifying the argument to this f, what does this become? TT, right? Because it'll be zero plus one t in the first coordinate and then zero plus one t in the second coordinate. So this is the limit as t goes to zero of f of tt over t. And then what is, what is f of, of tt? So it, in the first place, because of the way the function is defined and because of the way the limit is defined, we can actually plug in tt now. Which clause do we need to use? First. The first one, right? We're going to use the first one because the only time that we'd be using that one is if t were zero, but it's not because we're computing a limit going there. So that means that we use that one. <coughs> so this is the limit as t goes to zero <coughs> of, so x and y are both t, so what's the numerator there? t cubed, right? So that'd be t cubed, and then what's the denominator? 2t squared, and then all of that is over t, because that other t that's still in the limit. <clears throat> a bunch of t's floating around. Uh, what happens to all of them? They all cancel, right? Because uh, two of these are canceled by those two, and then there's one left, which is canceled by the last one. So all the t's cancel away. So this is the limit as t goes to zero of what's left? One half. And just what does one half do as t goes to zero? It's one half, that's what one half does. Okay, now wait a second. Wait a second, this couldn't possibly be right. <coughs> or th 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 this should raise some, some flags, some warnings. So what we're saying is that is that if you approach, if you approach along the x-axis, then it's, then it's flat. If you approach along the y-axis, then it's flat. But if you, if you, uh, horizontal is better, yeah. Uh, it's horizontal in the x direction, it's horizontal in the y direction, but if you approach along the direction 1, 1, then it has slope half, so try to imagine what that means. <clears throat> if, you look at, uh, if you look at it from this point of view, that this is z, y, and x, <clears throat> it's saying that uh, it will be horizontal in this direction. So it's horizontal in that direction. And then it's also horizontal in this direction. So the red and the green themselves are enough to determine a plane, a flat thing, right? And that, that flat thing is horizontal. But if instead of doing that, if instead of, uh, only traveling with the x-axis or only traveling with the y-axis, instead of doing that, what if you come at it from an angle? Then you're going downhill in one direction and uphill in the other direction. It's saying that <clears throat> if you traveled this way, you'd be going into the page and this would be floating above the page. So now, have a look at those, at those three lines there the red and the green and the blue. Can you fit them all on one flat plane? You cannot. You can't fit them all on a flat plane. You can fit any two of them, but you can't fit all of them on a flat plane. So what's the conclusion about the differentiability of this function at the origin? It isn't differentiable. It's not differentiable. Therefore, f is not differentiable at the origin. Incredible. 
And if you take this blue line and you, you turn it a little bit, it'll still be, have some slope that's not zero. And what, what will happen is that if you turn it, eventually it will be zero when it hits the red. And if you turn it this way, eventually it'll be zero when it hits the green. But in between, it's not zero. Okay. So here's a function. Here's a function that has a Jacobian at a point, but it's not differentiable there. Okay, this is a problem. <laughs> this is a big problem. Okay, <clears throat> so now let's, let's uh, figure out a sufficient condition to make sure that, more or less, if the Jacobian, if, if something like the Jacobian exists, not exactly the Jacobian, then, then we can be sure that the function is in fact differentiable there. We can be sure that we're not in one of these weird uh, cases. <clears throat> so in order to get that, we need a definition. So this, defini this definition is uh, called continuously differentiable. Differentiable. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so let. <clears throat> let F, uh, sorry, let U be an open subset of Rn, uh, and let F uh, be differentiable. on you. So, so in particular, is differentiable at, at every point. So, so far, so far, um, <coughs> sorry, not differentiable. Let it be defined. On you. So, we have a function defined on an open set and let it further be the case let all partial derivatives of f be defined on u so now, what I was trying to say is that so far, this is just like that previous function. So, so far we haven't excluded that previous function. Because that function away from the origin, its partial derivatives exist because, uh, well, you can just use the, the, the quotient rule to compute them. Okay, and then at the origin, we explicitly use the formula the definition of derivative, and we found that it's differentiable there. So suppose that the partial derivatives are defined on u, and moreover, <coughs> that the partial derivatives are continuous. Then f is called continuously differentiable. Okay, so it's not evident from from the from what work we did on that specific f on the previous exercise, but this now excludes that one. So even though that f on the previous exercise is, in fact, differentiable at every point, that doesn't mean that it's continuous, that, that its partial derivatives, in fact, would be continuous. Yeah, that's a different matter. OK, so I promise you that that previous f has been excluded. You should confirm uh, that that's true <coughs> on your own time. Second definition. Uh, so. 
and the way you write this is the, the way you denote this one. Denoted that F is an element of C1 uh, on U. So that means that you're allowed to take up to one derivative uh, of f and all of its partials will be continuous. So <clears throat> furthermore, you could say we can define Cp. Uh, Cp. Cp, and that is that uh, all partial derivatives up to order P are continuous. So the standard example of things like these is things like, uh, well, the function f of x is, say, uh, x cubed polynomials, their first derivative, the first derivative of every polynomial is continuous uh, because every polynomial is itself continuous and the derivative of every polynomial is yet another polynomial, so in that way polynomials are some of the nicest functions that exist. You can, all of their derivatives are continuous. Uh, an example that is uh, slightly more interesting is how about this one? So f of x is say uh, x squared when x is greater than zero, zero when x is equal to zero, and negative two uh, negative x squared. when x is less than 0. So this is like, a, you might say, like a pretend cubic, you might say. It's like taking the standard parabola and taking the right side of it and taking another copy of the standard parabola and flipping it upside down and taking only, only the left side and then gluing them together. So it would look like, it would look like this. So this bit, you'd get this much. The red bit would be that. This one clause here would fill in the origin. And then the other clause <coughs> would be like this. So it kind of looks like a cubic a little bit. It's not, because it's gluing together two halves of a parabola. So if you were to stay away from the origin and just stay on the red one, then what would be the derivative of just the red bit? 2x would be the derivative over here. And then what would be the derivative of just the blue bit? Negative 2x. So the derivative of this one would be negative 2x, the der derivative of this one would be positive 2x, and then you could use the definition of derivative at the origin to conclude what's the derivative right there. Zero. Zero. So the derivative of this function looks like, looks kind of like absolute value, except the slopes are two instead of, uh, are, the slopes are two and negative two instead of one and negative one. Then, then, so that would be, it's continuously differentiable once, right? But then if you attempt to differentiate one more time, then the derivative, then it, it ceases to be continuously differentiable anymore, right? Because it won't be differentiable at the, at the pointy place. <coughs> okay, so this is a function that's, uh, that is C1. <coughs> Good, any question about this? So for those of you that are <laughs> mystified, if you, were, if you were to carefully differentiate it, the derivative on the right-hand side, you'd say, well, it looks like that on the right, 2x on the right. 
it looks like negative 2x on the left. And then if you carefully differentiate it using the definition at the origin, you'll observe that the derivative is in fact 0 at the origin. So what I just drew is, is continuous. But you can't differentiate it again because at the origin it's pointy. Okay. <coughs> so now, <coughs> uh, so here's the theorem. Let's, let's give the, the statement. <coughs> So, theorem. If uh, U, a subset of Rn, is open, and F from U to Rm is C1 on U, Then F is differentiable on U uh, and it's uh, it is it's no apostrophe uh, and it's uh, derivative matrix derivative is given by the Jacobian. So what this is saying is that if you have a function that's C1, more or less, then you, you can't be misled. If the function is C1, then it's differentiable and just as good or, or, or even better, you can compute its derivative using, using the Jacobian. Okay, so this last bit, you already knew this, because we already have a theorem, and we already proved it in class, that if a function is differentiable, then uh, its derivative is given by its Jacobian. So we already, we already said that. So that little red bit is just to remind you. The main bit is that if the function is C1, if it's C1, then it's, then it's differentiable. Okay. <coughs> So, historically, students get a little bit confused about this, so I want to make sure that it's clear. To be C1 means that you can compute all of the partial derivatives. And furthermore, all of the partial derivatives are continuous. Okay, so then to be C1 is a, is a statement about partial derivatives. But to be differentiable is a, is a much stronger statement. Uh, well, statements about partial derivatives are one thing. And then statements about differentiability, those are stronger statements. And what this is saying is that, well, if the partial derivatives are so good that they're continuous, then the function surely is differentiable. Okay, so let's prove it. So the proof of this is, uh, <coughs> is beautiful because it uses uh, a trick that we're going to use this time. Again, uh, for, for Clairaut's theorem, once more for Fubini's theorem, and then one last time for Stokes' theorem. We're going to use this trick four times. Okay, we're going to use this trick on four separate occasions, and this is the first one. And all that it is, well, r really, this isn't even the first time. This is the second time, because I already proved the fundamental theorem. So this, we're doing it five times, <laughs> and this is the second time. So what it is, is, is you're going, we're going to repeatedly use the mean value theorem, but we're going to do it in kind of a, uh, a remarkable way. Okay, so that's why I had to talk about the mean value theorem at the beginning. I hope you didn't think that was too non sequitur. Okay, <clears throat> so here we go. So specifically, we want to show <coughs> We need to show the following. We need to show that the limit, 
as vector h goes to 0 of 1 over the length of vector h of f of a plus h minus f of a. So this is the, this, what I've written so far, is the increment of, of function f at anchor a with increment size h. So this is the increment of the function. And then to be differentiable, to be differentiable is to say that there is a linear map uh, that arbitrarily well approximates the increment. Okay? And moreover, we're saying that that specific, ar that specific linear map is the Jacobian. So what we're saying <coughs> is that this bit, the increment of the function, minus the Jacobian of f evaluated at a, applied to h, this should be equal to 0 in limit. So that's what we want to show. <coughs> because what, we, what, what this would show is that if we, can, if we can show that this is true, that would mean that the function is differentiable, and moreover, its derivative is the Jacobian. Now, I'd like for you to look uh, on, the, on the opening pages of, of, the, um, of the notes when we were talking about the mean value theorem. And I'd like to remind you that I said, well, what if you replaced, what if we, what if you replaced the interval a to b with the interval a to a plus h? Then the mean value theorem would look like this. The increment of the function is equal to the derivative of the function evaluated somewhere multiplied by the increment. Okay. Notice that that appears right here. So our strategy is going to be to replace this with something that has to do with the, with the mean value theorem. <coughs> okay. So in particular, uh, presently, we have that f uh, is Rm, uh, sorry, Rn, to Rm, but we already discussed that f equal to f1 to fm is differentiable exactly when exactly when what yeah when all the coordinate functions are differentiable So that means that without loss of generality we'll assume that F is Rn to R. That is to say, you, you, I can either say, well, I'm just going to consider the case when F outputs a scalar, or if you like, I'll give you the argument for when you input a vector and output a scalar, and then you can rewrite that argument m times, <laughs> right? Because all, all that I need to show is that every single coordinate function is differentiable. OK. So <clears throat> now here's the trick. We'll take this expression. In fact, I'm going to start on a new page because it's a big expression. So we'll take the increment of the function, f of a plus h minus f of a. 
And I want you to imagine for a moment that the vectors that we're inputting are in R3. Because what I'm about to do is a little bit strange if I try and do it with index n. It may, it'll make more sense if, if n is definitely something like 3. So, specifically, let's say that this is f of <coughs> a1, a2, a3, plus h1, h2, h3, and then minus f of a1, a2, a3. Okay, so then adding those together, <coughs> that would be f of a1 plus h1, a2 plus h2, and then a3 plus h3 minus f of a1, a2, a3. <coughs> and now I'm going to do the same trick and, and see if you can... Uh, See if you can remember when I did it the first time. Yes? Like that? Okay. So now I'm going to I'm going to uh, subtract something and add it. So here we have f of a1 plus h1, a2 plus h2, a3 plus h3. And specifically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract. I'm going to subtract uh, f of a1 and then a1, uh, sorry, a2 plus h2 and then a3 plus h3. So if I subtract that much, then what else must I do? I must add that much. So I'll add that much in. So plus f of that same thing, f of a1 uh, and then a2 plus h2 and then a3 plus h3. So the red bit, that's the subtraction bit. I subtracted that much and the green bit is me adding it back in so I've, I've done nothing. Okay. So now I'm going to do the, the same trick again. So here I have two things in graphite. By the time I finish this expression, those two things will still be there. And the red ones will be the subtracted ones, and the green ones will be the added ones, and it'll be all together that I've done nothing. Uh, I, I've added it and subtracted nothing. So now I'm going to subtract <coughs> minus, <coughs> pardon me, f of, so now a1, a2, and then a3 plus h3. Okay, so now I subtracted that much. So notice that the first subtraction, the first subtraction was that I held the, the first coordinate fixed at a, but I allowed the, the second and third coordinates to be incremented. So this one, I held the first two fixed at a, but I allowed the third one to be incremented. So now I need to add that much back in. So f of a1. Uh, a2, and then A3 uh, plus H3. And then now, suppose that I, that I do this one more time, what would I have? So in the, in the first time I did it, I held the first coordinate fixed. The second time I did it, I held the first and second coordinate fixed at A. And the third time I do it, which coordinates are fixed? All three of them. And which one is that? That's the graphite one, right? That's that one right there. So that would be minus f of all of them are fixed. So if there had been 30 coordinates, then I would have had to do this one, you know, 30 times all the way down the line. I would have held the first one fixed, and then the first and second fixed, and then the first, second, third fixed all the way down to the first 29 are fixed, all the way down to the last one. So do you observe that I add and, add and subtracted nothing? 
Okay. <clears throat> so now, <coughs> what time is it? I hear y'all rustling. Uh, we're getting close to the end. <clears throat> okay, 180 seconds. We, we're not going to be able to do it, but we'll we'll, <laughs> we'll 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 get pretty pretty close. So what I want you to see is that in each row now, in each row now, for this subtraction, only the first coordinate is changing. Right? The second coordinates are the same, the third coordinates are the same. Only the first coordinate is moving. Similarly, uh, what am I saying? Ah, for, for, th for this one, only the second coordinate is moving because the first are the same, the last are the same, so only the second ones are moving. And similarly, the first are the same, the second are, th are the same, and the third ones are the same. So I've arranged it so that we have three rows, and in each row, in the first row, only the first coordinate is moving, in the second row, only the second coordinate is moving, and in the third row, only the third coordinate is moving. And I submit to you that even if we had done it with, with 88 coordinates, I could have done it. Uh, it just would have been a lot more writing. But, and here's the, here's the trick. For each one of these rows now, I'm going to invoke the mean value theorem. I'm going to invoke the mean value theorem to give me a position in between these two, between A1 plus H1 and A1, so that I'll be able to turn all of these differences into what? I'll be able to turn differences that look like this into statements that look like that. Specifically, differences that look like this into statements that look like that. So the next thing I'm going to do next time is I'm going to turn all of these into derivatives. So, so now, so we don't lose track of, of what it is that I'm doing and how this fits in with everything else. When was the first time that I argued this way? The fundamental theorem of calculus. The of calculus. And what, what did I, do you remember I did the add and subtract ju juggling? And what was the very next thing that I did in the, in the proof of the fundamental theorem? Yeah, I invoked the mean value theorem in every single piece. So this is the second time that we're proceeding this way, and it won't be the last. Have a nice uh, Tuesday.